Hello again. So in this video, my idea was essentially to read the open letter that I wrote to the congregation. Uh, for those of you who have not seen my other videos, I sampled or gave out the uh, letter that I wrote to the body of elders. So this is going to be a sample of the letter to the congregation. The only part that I'm excluding is something that I already covered in the other letter. Uh, I don't feel the need to read through it again. So this will be uh, the open letter I wrote to pretty much everyone who was not an elder. And I use the emailing list I use for congregation updates and announcements to get the addresses of people I did not regularly communicate with. Uh, my letter to the elders was sent on uh, Sunday, uh, a Sunday, around 6. This is the letter that I sent out at 6 o'clock Monday to the congregation as a whole. The reason I separated the letters was to be strategic, to where I did not want the body of elders, uh, I didn't give any wind or hint that I was planning on sending a letter to the whole congregation. Um, I didn't want them to be able to send out a blast email. I wanted them to have very little time to meet, discuss, and everything, and then plan the announcement for that Thursday, because the Sunday meeting was already passed. So to plan the public announcement for Thursday night, of course, or the midweek meeting. And, I mean, I have no idea of knowing how many people actually read this through or before they put up their apostate shields, despite there being nothing apostate about this letter, as you'll see when I read it. Um, I'm sure many read it just thinking, oh, this is just going to be like an encouraging thing from me, um, which it was meant to be, but it was also a, a goodbye and a public declaration of what I was doing, uh, as will be seen when I read through it. Um, well, let's begin. Dear brothers and sisters, the circumstances of the last five years have been hard on many people. I want to encourage everyone to never lose faith or hope in Jesus and his Father. Before the world was founded, Jesus was slain. God determines the end from the beginning. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. John 14.6, Isaiah 46.10, and Revelation 13.8. The Bible is the greatest love story. It's a story of God bringing his family back together through the work of Christ. God has already won the chess match through this work that he and his son accomplished. Rejoice, for those who accept the son have the victory. The God of this system spreads deceit, lies, and despair through those who have given themselves as puppets to his kingdom. How do we fight discouragement? We must look to our Savior, our Redeemer, the only begotten Son of the Almighty Father who sent him forth. Before the world was founded, this Son was slain. We have no other name by which we are saved. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, and Acts 4, 12. Jesus is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the ransom. It is by the grace, or the undeserved kindness of God, that we have this salvation option. We take hold of this through faith, acceptance of Christ and his ways, and repentance. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is trifle through grace, acceptance, and repentance, not by our own labors. No labor by the hand of a human being can pay the ransom. It was a debt impossible to pay within the material realm. We only had debt. You cannot pay debt with debt. The blood of Jesus covers this debt for all time, both forward and backward. We must never ask if our sin can be covered, because it is through true repentance. 
to doubt this would be to question the value of Jesus' blood. One might say, is not faith without works dead? But what works? The acceptance of Christ and his ways. It means walking in righteousness in alignment with the ways of the Father and the Son. This is our act of faith. To study the ways of Jesus, a perfect mirror of the Father, and to walk in their example as written in the scriptures. By doing this, Jesus, who is the King and Judge, who holds the keys of death and Hades, will judge accordingly. Is there anything in the scriptures to show that Jesus would ever judge unfairly or cruelly? Acts 17.29 Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, Jesus, he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. By no other name do we have salvation, and Jesus has been handed the authority to judge. John 5, 22 and 27. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. James 5, 9, Acts 10, 42, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, John 8, 15 and 16. Romans 14, 10 reads, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. Jesus will judge hearts and deeds. He has the authority. He has the power. He has the righteousness to do so justly. Not any man. Thank God. Is that an encouraging thought or what? The body of Christ has a perfect head and judge, the Lamb of God. Colossians 1.18 James 2, 12 and 13 reads, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who is not merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Man has a pattern of building systems that corrupt over time. They move away from God and his Son and their ways and incorporate more features of sinful humanity. Jeremiah 17, 5 states, this is what Yehoah says. Cursed is the man who puts his trust in mere humans, who relies on human power, and whose heart turns away from Yehoah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Zechariah 7 says that they harden their hearts like flint. But God is unchanging. Malachi 3.6 Jesus came and broke the back of the religious system of his day that had turned into an oppressive, corrupt, and cruel regime that made the people sigh and weep. The yoke of Jesus is light. His ways are kindly. Jesus approached, taught, and healed all manner of sinner. Jesus did not turn anyone away, not even Gentiles, tax collectors, adulterers, wealthy, poor, or even Nicodemus, a religious leader. Jesus allowed men who wanted to kill him to question him. And it's the same with the Father who allowed men to question him, as Abraham was Sodom and Gomorrah. What an amazing example. The Almighty Creator and the firstborn Son allow themselves to be inquired of by humans, fallen humans especially. So like the Father, Jesus gave much opportunity for a change in attitude. Jesus overturned the tables of the corrupt. He revealed the hypocrisy of the elites. He broke class systems within the body of Christ. He rebuked and cast out evil spirits and empowered Christians to do so. He fulfilled the law and the old covenant. Jesus opened the way for anyone whose heart is true towards him to be saved. Romans 10.13, Acts 2.21, and Joel 2.32. Jesus did not and will not turn away from those who serve righteousness with a pure heart. Jesus came to minister to the sinners. He's, he's, he, he, ugh, ugh, words are hard. he sees value in all because he died for all mankind, even those who hated him. 
Jesus gave mercy, and he expects those who follow him to do the same. Jesus showed love, and he expects those... That's deja vu. Jesus was the fulfillment of a temporary law system that offered no salvation. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When we do anything, ask if that is what Jesus would do. Emulate him. Follow him, for he is the way to the Father. Ephesians 5.2 reads, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. One question I have often asked in my head, would I have had the courage to stay in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what was coming? As far back as I can remember, I have loved God and Jesus. I love my Bible stories, the cassette tapes, and the great teacher book. I follow my shepherd. I know his voice. I am a witness for God and of the Son, and I walk with the Holy Spirit. The best of my ability. Beloved older ones, never think that the God of heavens and his Son do not notice your hearts. You are so faithful and seek to serve God so wholeheartedly. But I love you all so much, as Christ loves his congregation. He died for all mankind. I exhort you all to walk in the fruits of the Spirit and to care for widows and orphans. There exists a God in the heavens who exposes secrets. Any secrets kept in dark places are being revealed soon. I have an assignment to do. I know you will not understand. I must walk with God. I must serve my Lord. I must trust in them. Accursed is whoever puts his faith and trust in human beings, or he who supplants the role of the Christ. I am being moved into a new season in my life. My primary regret is the pain and confusion it will cause, but I ask please to focus on Jesus and the salvation promised to all who accept him. Dig into the Bible, follow Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And now, the hour has come. For you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Yes, I am telling you these things now, so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier, because I was going to be with you for a while longer. John 16.2 I pick up my torment. I love you all. And signed my name. I, my full name, am officially disassociating myself from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania corporation and all of its subsidiary legal entities and the date may the peace of god which transcends all understanding be with you to guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus oh that was a reading of the full letter that i sent out to everyone oh if anyone can find this useful helpful Encouraging as they try to make up their own decision. I know there are many uh, physically and mentally out witnesses out there right now. I'm in touch with such in my own uh, sphere. And I know it's a scary thing. I know it's a, a difficult thing. But it's a decision that you have to consider very carefully. And there is fallout and consequences. But I truly do believe that the watchtower, the bricks are coming out. So they're crumbling. Underneath more scrutiny, lawsuits, issues, unfulfilled prophecy, weird doctrine that's very easily cross-examined. And part of my motivation right now is to try to get myself into a position to help uh, essentially refugees when the thing is exposed with what I think is probably going to happen at some point in the future. I hope this was helpful or enjoyable. I hope you all have a good night.